So today we are talking about workaholism. It's quite a big topic. Uh, did anyone listen? Did anyone listen? Give me a wave or let me know in chat. Um, yeah, sorry about the embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, I don't know why, it just got increasingly random, increasingly random. I started reeling off poetry, don't know why that was useful, and um, confessing to things that I probably shouldn't. So embarrassing stories, yes, that's probably, I mean, um, if you haven't listened, don't worry about it, no one needs to know some of those things. Uh, but maybe, maybe you can let me know yours. What happened to the lamp decision? Oh, Steve, I can't even remember what the lamp thing was. <laughs> this is what I mean. I can't even remember what I talk about. I don't even know. What? Oh, the lamp. I remember I still haven't bought a lamp. Also, for anyone. Oh, God, did that, did that make the cut? Oh, God. I might need to speak to our producer and be like, knock that stuff out. Um, I appear to have been chatting about a lamp that I was buying for my living room. Oh gosh. Um, the backstory to the lamp is my nan wants to buy me the lamp and she's 94 and I take her investment in my life very seriously, which is putting extra pressure on getting the right lamp. Um, so yes, I still haven't got the right lamp, but nanny's coming for Christmas. So it kind of kind of needs to be in place with them. Um, okay, yeah, just... Remind me of the random things I say. And if it ever gets too random, just send me a private message and be like, Helen, it's too much. Um, so what happens when we record late at night? Anyway, workaholism, which is what we're here for today. I thought we would do um, a little bit of a squiggly sense check on where we're at with workaholism as a, as a group now. So we're going to use the annotations. I'm conscious that a couple of people are new and also Zoom has changed some stuff. So I'm just going to do a little practice of annotation before we do that. So we're going to do a little bit of a assessment as a group about what workaholism looks like for us right now and then we're going to get into some of the ideas for action and get your builds get your insights get your builds Dave Sarah that's normally what we do like kind of learn from each other I'm just sort of the and Sarah is just the conduit for the sharing across the community so let me get my screen up um, and then I thought we'd just do a little bit of a little bit of a tech check um on um on uh Annotations. So can you stick a star on my screen for people who know how to do that? For people who have never done it before, you're looking for something on your screen that says view options and comes up with like this thing here. And then you want to go to annotate. And then you just want to go to that bit there. So that little cross. Um, oh, I need to turn, I'll turn that off. Let me make an an, an can I make it anonymous? Hide names of anonate. Oh God, I can't speak today, everyone. Anonators? Workalism? It's just the T. It's the T and a sore throat, I promise. Um, okay, stars. Okay, I think we know how to do it. Is anyone struggling? Anyone struggling? Because it's kind of, um, I'm going to use this a little bit in a moment. Um, I think sometimes if you are joining via, if you're joining via, um, what do I mean? Your phone. Uh, it can be a bit trickier. All right, I think we got it. I think we got it. So I thought we would go through for people for people that um, listen to the podcast. Sarah and I talked about there were two different surveys that we found that help you to assess your level of workaholism. I'm just going to say it like that so I can say everyone workaholism. Um, and I thought I would go through the short ones. There's four questions, um, and you give yourself a, a, a score of one to five. Uh, one is no, I don't think that's very like me. Five is yes, that feels very like me. So we're just going to put stars on the scale against the four statements. I'll read each one in turn. I'm going to read them off here so I get the actual kind of like the right statement and I stick to it. Um, so let me find those. Um, and then we'll just get a bit of a sense as a group of what, what this looks like for us. So let me find the statements. Where have they gone? Um, I think I wrote them down on where. Okay, here we go. I've got the statements. I'm going to clear off your lovely stars so that we can start from scratch. So let's do that. It's very confusing having all that there. Um, all right, statement number one, if I can get to it, um, is about I work because there is a part inside of me that feels compelled held to work so five would be so stick a star on the scale basically five would be yes that is me I feel compelled to work that's a big part of me uh, one would be no I feel kind of I don't feel compelled to work so go with that one first of all okay our next statement is it is difficult for me to stop thinking about work when I stop working um so that's our second statement five like I'm like can't, can't stop, doesn't stop. <laughs> it's probably mine. Uh, but what, where are you, where are you at on that one? Okay. Uh, third statement. I feel upset if I have to miss a day of work for any reason. I feel upset 
if I have to miss a day at one, I don't feel upset. That's great. Uh, five, I feel like, you know, I've sort of lost momentum or, I don't know, my identity is so attached to my work that, that I feel kind of lost without it, that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, and then statement number four is about contribution. I tend to work beyond my job's requirements. So five, like I always, I'm always doing more than needs to be done. Um, one, no, 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 uh, that is my job. I do it and then I stop. Um, so what have we got here? What a little, let's look at these, some of these patterns that we have got from our lovely community. So it looks like the concerned one, we don't, lots of us don't relate to that one. So that one's a bit lower. Helpful, Helen. And um, that one around being concerned, it seems kind of more like we're not, we're not concerned if we're not working. But the other three feels a bit higher. In order to kind of work out your workaholism score, basically add up, add up your scores, add up what you've got. Um, and the research says that if you have, if your total score is 15 or above, you are displaying significant signs of workaholism. So let's just clear that for a moment. And I'm going to clear your stars. And then I'm going to clear all that. And I'm going to put two blobs on this screen. Let's make it, let's make it blue again for us. Let's just see where you are. So if you've got 15 or more, then that's significant displays of workaholism. So let's kind of have 15, I'll write it in here. So if you think you are 15 or more on your score, put a star here for me. If you are kind of less than 15, you're gonna go here. Where are we at everyone? Where are we at as a group? Where are we at? Um, ooh. Half and half. It was interesting. So I did this. I did this as well. So I would definitely say that I demonstrate uh, some workaholistic tendencies. However, I took this score and I was lower than 15. And I was like, oh, maybe I'm not so bad. And there is another one that we link to in the pod note, which has 20 statements. Sarah talked about it on the podcast. Um, and those 20 statements are quite useful because they because this, I could go, oh, I've not, got, I've not got a problem here. I might be like, I'm fine. I'm below 15. I don't need to worry about it. When actually, I think there are some things that I do that aren't particularly healthy um, in terms of my working behaviours. And I could spot more of them when I looked at the list of 20. Um, so maybe, you know, if you're like, oh, I'm surprised I've kind of a bit lower. If you're 15 or more, we're going to talk about that now because this this is going to create challenges for you unless we do something different. Um, if you're 15 or lower and you're like, mm, do I buy this? Um, maybe have a look at those 20 questions because I, I did see, I was like, oh, that, that is something, that's sort of trap that I fall into. Um, any reflections on anything we talked about so far before we move on? Did anyone feel, uh, did anyone, uh, so it's, uh, I feel compelled, I feel concerned, I can't stop. And the third one, so I get it right for you, Caroline, I work beyond my job's requirements. I tend to work beyond my job's requirements. That is from, we've also linked this in the pod note this week, that is from a really good Harvard Business Review um, guide uh, called A Workaholic's Guide to Reclaiming Your Life. Um, they do these on Harvard Business Review, they do this big idea series, which I love because they put lots of different articles together. Um, it's one of Sarah and my like ambitions that we'll go from articles to like a big idea series on, you know, squiggly careers or learning at work. Speak what you seek, everyone, speak what you seek. Um, so I'm, I'm putting it, putting it out there. Um, okay, any other reflections? A bit of guilt? Oh, that's interesting. That's an interesting thing. So, oh gosh, no, I definitely don't think we want to, I definitely don't think we want to like, um, it's a really interesting reaction, that one. Maybe it ties into a confidence gremlin. But no, I don't I don't think we want to glamorize workaholism. Like, this is not so good for your brain. Where's my lovely picture of the brain gone? Um, I think I've lost it somewhere. Um, no, this is this is not so good for your brain. There are some really, really good reasons why we might want to do something different here. So um the research shows that people who display significant amounts of workaholism like as in their tendencies their behaviors the stuff that we just talked about so you know you feel compelled you can't stop you're always going beyond you you know you feel like a loss of identity when you're not working that kind of response to work not great for you not great for your company so the research shows that people who are in this I, was, I talked on the podcast like a wave of workaholism which I think is more what I have rather than constant I think I have waves of it at work and um, when you when I am in a wave and when people have these tendencies uh, they have fewer ideas and um, they have less focus because they're trying to do everything all over the place 
and they are actually less productive. And it said that um, the kind of statement I remember was like, you get in your way and your organization's way over the long term. So I definitely don't think we should be glamorizing or celebrating workaholism. I think we should be asking, what can we do differently? And some of that is like an individual thing, because I think sometimes there's an individual attachment to this way of working and we have to address that and sometimes I think that is a contextual thing like the place that we are working in has created this environment where this feels like the norm but whether it is individual individually led or like a result of our context not good not good at all um any other reflections on this uh creativity would be narrowed waves of work yeah the waves thing I found I don't think I am a workaholic all the time but I definitely see waves if I look back at my career I can see these kind of periods where those things that we just talked about in terms of the assessment were all very very true um it's quite I think it's quite useful to reflect if you if that um waves of workaholism resonates with you I think it's useful to reflect on what was going on that led to my behavior at that point in time because if you can spot some of those things you can start to unpick the patterns. This is where you get into all the territory of coaching yourself. This is, you know, like unpicking your patterns because otherwise we just repeat the same behaviors and we end up with the same outcome. So if, if it resonates with you, it might be, might be worth a reflection. Uh, Sean says, I think it's important to acknowledge that lots of roles have occasions where extra work and effort is required, but it's not workaholism. Oh, I can't say it, everybody. Workaholism. Um, yes, Sean, I completely agree with you. And, and the research says the same thing. Um, workaholism is not just working a lot of hours. That is not it. That's that's a different thing. Um, it might be a demanding job or you know whatever it is, but that is not workaholism. Workaholism is when you can't switch off from work and you deprioritize, um, consistently deprioritize other things that are important to you. Exercise, friends, family, like things, other things that you need and give you, uh, need you joy. <laughs> a colleague would start an angry mass email oh gosh and I, I mean angry mass email is never good just regardless of what follows i'm too busy to be dealing with this to give you an idea of how overloaded i'm sending this mail from the toilet <laughs> interesting we'd love to know how, how people respond to that um okay so uh let's go into let's go into a few ideas i think everybody um clearly it's something that we all i think most of us relate to apart from that third statement about the kind of like feeling like we can't enjoy things when work stops um so let's get into a few ideas let's do some let's do some builds and see if we can help each other um to, to sort of reduce the wave reduce the wave um so the first uh, thing that we talked about here is about redoing your to do so the problem here if you are a workaholic or in a wave of workaholism is that to do lists and can kind of feed the problem a little bit so we have a tendency to fill this to do list with almost like an unlimited of things that we need to do. And everything feels urgent, everything feels important. And we really, we struggle to prioritize. So we can't stop because our list doesn't stop. And it becomes overwhelming and you know you can just get stuck in this kind of spiral of so much to do, so much to do, which feeds the workaholism. Um, there is a school of thought that says that it's okay to have a list of things that need to be done, but not to drive your days with it. So almost have a list that you kind of dump stuff on. So it's not, don't think of it as your to-do list. Just think of it as like a dump. It's like a dump of actions. And then what you want to do is almost use your dump to map your work. So, and there are a couple of ways that you can map it. So for example, the way, the way that I like Matt, I had, I do have a dump list. I can show you my diary if it helps, but I have a dump of like all the stuff I have to do. And then you can look at that list and I map it to sort of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And basically if it doesn't fit, I like carry it over or cross it out or, but I don't treat the complete list as the thing that I try to do in a day because it's impossible and you just beat yourself up and then you get into like this spiral of, I need to work more, I can't work, you know, all, you know, you probably know it. Um, so the idea is you have a list and you map it. Um, David Allen talks about this a little bit in the podcast with Sarah Ellis, um, Sarah Ellis, just Sarah, Sarah as well. Sarah Ellis, my business partner, my friend of 20 odd years. I've now just started calling formally Sarah Ellis. I should remember her middle name then. I should totally know her middle name. Mm, it will come to be in a moment. Sarah something Ellis. 
I'll work it out. Um, anyway, uh, don't tell her I've forgotten that. She'll hate me even more than the fact that I offered to buy her some pans for her new house, which she, she really was not very happy about at all. Moving on. Um, the other thing that you can do, and this is in the article, actually, the, the Big Idea series, it talks about the idea of um, triage. Um, I think it might be Marie. Sarah Marie Ellis. I'm going to have to text her later. <laughs> <laughs> don't, please don't tell her. No one tell her this. It's bothering me now. Um, so they talk in the article about triage. And you know, obviously doctors, I mean, doctors have an impossible amount of work to do. So they kind of have a triage system, which is the same sort of thing for a to-do list. Um, and when, I mean, I guess it's kind of harsh, but when they're looking at patients, they kind of have a, a, a kind of red, absolutely urgent need to get on with this, amber needs to be you know progressed relatively quickly but it's not top of the top of the pile and then green can leave this one for longer apparently there's a black as well but I didn't quite get what the black was and I thought I'll leave that one but I quite like this idea of you know you're going to have your list of things and your red amber green the main thing is you need to look at this to-do list as sort of a process it's not just a dump of everything that needs to be done you can write that stuff down so you don't have to hold it in your head which is distracting but it's this idea of sort of triage or mapping and that is that is a much more healthy process for you to get into um i'm an ex-doctor a lot of us workaholics feel the need to unlearn the pool that's that's very insightful and honest camilla thank you for sharing um what other reflections have you got on getting things done method i find useful categorize what the next action is yeah I think I've told you this before but I once went on a getting things done training session in an Anya High March store she makes bags I mean this is my dream it's like productivity and bags in the same place brilliant however this session on getting things done my my diary is normally quite packed like I go from you know go from one thing to the next we'll leave that for another day um but I remember I had to leave this like event on on the dot right so and I was like getting things done it'll be done it ran over it's like this this is the worst thing ever how can you have a thing that's all about productivity and it runs over and I have to leave and feel really awkward because I'm being productive anyway any other any other reflections on this um that was interesting teachers and workaholism as well it's interesting, isn't it? Like it's it's kind of shared across lots of lots of different uh, different professions. So maybe just I guess the the point here is maybe just review before you redo. Maybe just review your to do. What is your process at the moment in terms of how you create your list of jobs to get done, and how are you prioritizing and filtering that so that there is an end, right? I think if it is endless is not helping there needs to be an end to the to-do that you can actually do in a day um so you can see um okay what have we got next partner up um i have found this very helpful it helps because my partner my work partner um also sort of life partner even though i don't know middle name um is very different to me so you know you have if you feel like you have got um a kind of workaholic tendencies i think what a partner can do is they can act a little bit like a mirror to you. They can put a mirror up and go, hmm, that's an interesting way of working. So for example, when I'm in a wave of workaholism, I I think I get, I, well, Sarah's given me feedback, like mirroring my behavior. A, I never get up from my desk. She's like, that's really weird. And, and I just start consuming liquid food because it's quick. <laughs> and she's like, that's really strange. I mean, she just eats curly whirly, so I'm not sure she's better. But I do notice like the more liquid food I have in the day, that's because I'm like, I can have it at my desk. Um, and I don't I don't go for a walk, uh, which is not great for ideas. And then the other thing is, I think I get shorter in conversations. So she will say to me, oh, you were a bit, you were a bit too like one way, you're a bit too directive there, or you talk too fast because you're just trying to get everything done. And I think it is very useful if you can partner with someone on a project, because obviously I have I have Sarah as like my partner partner, but I appreciate that might not be everyone's context. But if you can partner with someone on a project and maybe ask for some feedback and say, oh, you know, one of the things I'm trying to work on is kind of my boundaries, my kind of ways working. Do you see anything in me um, that you think is is kind of creating this impression of work never getting done or um, this idea of workaholism? Just someone that you trust can potentially give you give you that feedback. Drinking hot water as quicker than making tea is my red flag. <laughs> is my red flag to slow down? I do think, yeah. What is your red flags? Like, yeah, mine is if I'm too short in conversations, like too quick and too short, as and I'm not inviting other people. Too much liquid food. 
definitely. Um, and too long, too long at my desk. Um, what, what are your red flags, everyone? Out of interest, that's an interesting... Uh, knowing you're not looking after yourself, Amy. So that's that point, isn't it, around we are prioritising um, work over other things that are important to us. Too much tea? Looks like tea is a problem. Who knew tea? Uh, yeah, they're not moving. Oh, Reg, bad sleep. It was a really interesting idea that you should look at successful people that work differently to you. Yeah. And also, I think, Steve, we make these assumptions, don't we, about successful people have got it all sorted. I'm not, I'm not sure that's true. Um, the kid's telling me to put my phone down. Yeah, that's a good That's a good one. Um, I get, like, the look now from my daughter, Madeline. Mummy! I'm like, oh, being called out by a seven-year-old. Um, logging on at random hours of the night. I sign up to too much learning. That's interesting. Um, what else have we got? Not getting any exercise, Sean. Oh, maybe we could have a pop plus exercise session, maybe one, one for another day. Uh, not taking annual leave yet, all, all good to go. Okay, so the point, yeah, the point here is, I think, know what your red flags are, but sometimes we don't know them. I think that's also the point. We don't know what they are. And so other people can maybe spot and see um, things that are quite helpful, quite helpful for us. Um, what else have we got? Watch your words. What do we mean by this? Um, sometimes we have a narrative for ourselves that gets us stuck in this pattern of behavior. And it's useful to like know your narrative. So maybe I'll say mine and um and you can you can like let me know. So some I, I think some of my narrative, my team probably hear this all the time. They're like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I think I have like a I don't know if I I think I don't know if I always say this, but it's my internal narrative. It's like I need, like I need to do it. So um, oh I'll, I'll do that, or I need to do it. It's very, I leap to the I. I'll do that. I need to do it. I need to get it done by. So I create impossible dates. I put my hands up for things that I don't need to all the time. And there's no reflection of the people. It's just, I eye myself in too much to things. I also think I have a, if I don't do it, it won't get done. Um, which I also think most of the time is not true, but that's, that's the, that's the narrative that I create um oh home life too yeah probably yeah probably um I think probably this is a watch your words potentially also the side point here is ask for help I think that's probably probably a side point that we didn't talk about in the podcast but I think the um I I the point here with the watch your words is kind of know what you're saying so if I have my like uh if I don't do it it won't get done and um, and almost like reframing that. So I guess a reframe for me there could be if no one else wants to do it, maybe it's not the right thing to do. <laughs> like that might be like if no one else is saying, oh, yeah, I'd like to get involved in that, Helen. Um, maybe it's just not the right thing to do. Maybe that is a flag, a better flag that something else could be better. And no, watching your words, understanding what your narrative is that is reinforcing this pattern. Does anyone else have... um? Similar ones, like do you like? Oh, I have that one too. Or do you have a different one? Um, any other, any other ones that you have? Like, what do you think you say that keeps you in these sort of patterns of behaviours where you create more work than could possibly done, and assume you have to be the person that needs to do it? What else do you say? If you can't think of one, it might it might be worth you reflecting on what you say. You know, in those waves of workaholism. It might be like I think I probably also have like I don't want to let people down. I need to get it done. It needs to be done quickly. I'll miss the opportunity if I don't move it forward. They're probably all things that I say to myself. Can I trust others? That's honest, Tracy. Um, if I don't know everything, I'll get everything that's going on. I need to be across everything or I'll get called out. Uh, worried about others. A boss-based thing. I just need a few more hours. Oh, yeah, I know that one. Just need, I just need a few more hours. I just need a few more hours. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, uh, I need to protect my team. So kind of very team-based, yeah. Um, but you, and I guess the role model there, you know, this area, that one, you know, the reframe there. I, I need to get it done to protect my team. But I guess the reframe there is, how can my team protect their work if they don't see me protecting mine? might be like a reframe there of like that you need to role model this in order for them to be able to learn from it otherwise they will assume that when they become a manager they have to behave in the same way that that we are um there's another one a carrot of promotion i'm doing a presentation on this today sean um how to progress when you can't get promoted 
doing a very, a very, um, very much on that point. Um, okay, two minutes, and I think we've got two more ideas. Two more ideas, one in each minute. Um, so this one is about switching over versus switching off. So the idea of just turning off your work colors and tendencies probably isn't very realistic. It's probably connected to your values, like I have a value of achievement. It's very much connected to that. We, just, we can't just turn you off. But what we can do is make some switches. So we take that energy that you have basically got for getting things done and moving things forwards and helping other people. We take that energy and apply it to some other stuff. Don't stop work, but spread the energy. So for example, it could be a fitness, it could be like a fitness thing. Maybe you think, oh, I'm going to put my, all that energy into achieving something on a fitness basis, or maybe it's learning. Um, maybe that's a healthier thing for you to do. Or maybe it's like relationships. You think, oh, I'm going to have a curious career conversation every month, or, or I'm going to have a phone call with my family once a week, like whatever, whatever feels more of a priority. But the energy that you have for doing things is part of who you are. And we don't want to, we don't want to get rid of that. We just want to make sure that it's not all applied to one thing. Anyway, in the same way that I think there's like a, a holism for fitness, isn't there? You know, for like people who put all it into fitness, I think applying this energy into any one thing probably isn't healthy, but you clearly have that energy. We just want to maybe spread it onto a few more things. Um, last but not least, ways of working. So this is, you know, I was talking about the context, the, the kind of environment that you're working in, I think can also contribute to your workaholism. So I think there are kind of um, response responsiveness that we need to talk about right response times because if if you don't if you haven't agreed response times everyone feels like they have to be always on whereas if you say like don't worry like don't reply between seven and seven in the evening like you don't no one needs to do that um or like as long as you reply within 24 hours it's all good like set some expectations around response times um set some expectations about channels and I think, I mean, I think I'm bad at this. We we have agreed certain channels in our team and sometimes I cross them. And so I think it's okay to give people feedback on this as well. Like agree your team ways of working. And when those ways aren't working, I think that should probably just be reset. Um, and so I think this is probably quite a regular conversation. I don't think you fix and forget this one. I think like it's probably one to, to reset. Team, I might have this chat, might have this chat next week, see whether we need to do anything different. And they're just healthy, healthy conversations for everyone to have.